church. At this time, the ushers are going to be handing out a map entitled Turning the World Upside Down. And that's the name of the lesson today. There are two maps. The first map is about Paul's first and second missionary journeys. And the second one's entitled Paul's third and fourth journey. Of course, the fourth journey really being one he took unvoluntarily to Rome right there. Amen? And, uh, but I think by having the map in front of you, it will allow you to visualize a little bit more clearly uh, cities like Troas or Athens or Philippi as we go through our study today. We have four points as we cover Acts 16 through 21. Number one, uplifting vision. Chapter 16, 1 through 10. Number two, side-by-side preaching. Chapter 16, 11, all the way through 17. Number three, knocked down, but not knocked out. (laughs) Chapter 18 and 19. And lastly, make the most of today. Chapters 20 and 21. Let's get started. We concluded our lesson the last time we were together, focused in on the Jerusalem Council and, of course, the parting of Paul and Barnabas and the sad and yet heroic story of John Mark. The time right here as we pick up chapter 16 as Paul begins the second missionary journey is about 49 to 50 A.D., He's picked Silas as his partner in the gospel. And he's about to meet a young man that's going to turn the world upside down. Let's watch Paul and his companions. Verse 1. An uplifting vision. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Right here, Paul returns to some of the churches that he planted on his first missionary journey. And when he gets to Lystra, he sees Timothy. It's been a couple of years now, and so Timothy has become a powerful young man. His mom, we know, was a disciple. We know from 2 Timothy that his grandma was a disciple. But his dad never became a Christian. And so because of that, he had a Gentile background, and he was never circumcised. Well, when Paul heard about Timothy, when he saw the impact of his life, he says, man, you've got to come on my missionary expedition. You've got to come with me and Silas. It'll be awesome. He said, but here's the thing. When we go into every city, I make it a point, first of all, to go to the synagogue. And then after we preach there, we go to the Gentiles. Now here's the thing. You know, if we take you into the synagogue uncircumcised, it's not going to be good for any of us. Now, Paul had just gotten through going up to Jerusalem and dealing with the issue of circumcision. There were some amongst the brotherhood there that said that every man who became a Christian from a Gentile background had to be circumcised. And Paul and Barnabas fought it fiercely. No, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. You simply have to have faith, repent, become a disciple, and be baptized into Jesus Christ. Amen? But right now, here Paul is saying, but... If we're going to win the Jew, we've got to become like the Jew. And so, Timothy, here's the thing. If you want to come with me, then you got to get circumcised. Now, the kid's about 18 years old right here. This is a big decision. <laughs> this is a big decision. You know, we use the expression, do anything, go anywhere, and give up everything. This is what Timothy was dealing with right here. <laughs> and you know something? This was the decision he made. He says, I want to be able to go preach with you, Paul. I want to learn. I want to be discipled. I want to turn the world upside down. And I will do whatever it takes, even circumcision, in order to make that decision. He makes the decision. 
and they move on. And the Bible says that as they go to each town where the church was established, they deliver the decision of James, remember, the half-brother of Jesus, who made the decision that circumcision was not necessary for salvation. And then we find very curiously, verse 5, it says, And so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Now that's, that's an awesome scripture, but it's, it's very awesome when we remember that the church began in Acts chapter 2. The kingdom began in Acts 2. And of course they had 3,000 people baptized the first day. Now that really was a Thanksgiving day. Amen, guys? But out of that, the Bible says, by verse 47, chapter 2, that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That was the church in Jerusalem. You say, well, it was a church in Jerusalem. And they started with 3,000 baptisms. That's a great running start right there. But in each of these cities, it was Paul and Barnabas and a few others that went in them. And now each of these churches, all the other churches they had established, were now having daily baptisms. That's what it's all about, is seeing as many people as possible come to salvation through Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I look forward to the day, and I don't think it'll be too far off, where the city of Angel Church, we're going to be having daily baptisms. Are you with me right here? Now, let's go on in the text. The uplifting vision. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. You can look at your map and get an idea of where that's at. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Now, the province of Asia is the western part of what's modern-day Turkey. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Now, you know, right here, we see the writer, Luke, is very conscious of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. And certainly this is through dialogue with Paul. A lot of us think that God is with us and God answers our prayers when God says, yes, yes, yes. But sometimes God answers our prayers, no, no, no. (laughs) And we think he hasn't answered. Oh, he's answered okay. Paul says right here, they want to go in the Spirit into the province of Asia. And the Holy Spirit stops them. They want to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to. Some have thought, well, there was perhaps pestilence. Maybe there was rioting, civil unrest. Maybe there was war. Maybe there was just antagonism towards Paul and going on in. We don't know. But what we do know is this, is that Paul trusted the sovereignty of God. And that means that whatever happened to him, he believed with all of his heart. That God either made it happen or he allowed it to happen. And so even though he got blocked from doing this and blocked from doing that, he understood that the Spirit of Jesus was guiding him. How about it? Is that your heart? Or do you get bitter when you don't get your way? You see, right here, Paul's going, Amen, God is guiding us. The answer to our prayer, no, 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 is just as definitive and just as guiding as yes, yes, yes. And we need to understand it is God's sovereignty that is guiding us where we're going. Are you with me right here? Now this is cool. Verse 8. So I passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. Well, something was supposed to happen there. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him. Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Right here... Is one of the great turning points in the ministry of Paul. Some have called this the Macedonian call or the Macedonian vision. Of course, we, we sing the song, you know, take the light. You know, we've heard the Macedonian call today, take the light. Well, what's the big deal? Well, if you look at your map, you see what the big deal is. In the first missionary journey, Paul's efforts centered mostly in lower Asia Minor. Now, God had taken him to the western part of what's modern-day Turkey or Asia Minor, to Troas. But all of his preaching is in what you and I would call the continent of Asia. Then one night, Paul has a dream of this guy from Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is right on top of Greece right there. And this guy in Macedonia is saying, Paul, please come and help us. And, And I love it right here. It says... In verse 10, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once. So now we understand that Luke has joined the missionary team. You know, vision is such an essential thing to motivate us. You see, right here we find that Paul no longer was desired by God to focus in on Asia Minor. 
and the kind of Asia. He wanted Paul to stretch his vision and go from Asia to Europe. God wants each of us to stretch our vision from where we're at. You know, it was incredible. This past week, we had the blessing, Elena and myself, to go to New York City with DJ and Casey Commonsford. And we also met up with the Grimas right there. And it was a survey trip for the planting of our new church in New York next summer. It's going to be cranking, guys. And it was great to be there. We did a lot of great things. And I'd been to New York several times, and one of the things that was very moving was going up into the World Trade Center. But that's been taken away. But I'd never been up into what now is the tallest building in New York City. And you know, DJ being from the younger generation, is sometimes a bit cynical about doing some touristy type things. So I said, DJ, Casey, let's go up into the Empire State Building. DJ goes, okay, that means I don't really want to, but we'll do it anyway. So, we go on up, you know, all the way up to 86th floor. And it was right at dusk as it's turning into night. And see all the lights flickering and coming on into this mammoth city of almost 20 million people. Now, L.A. is about the same size, but it's very spread out. Can you imagine L.A. just crimped together like this? And just pushed up like that? That's New York City. We got up there. We started walking around, and I could just sense the energy that was coming to DJ and Casey. And I said, guys, we need to pray over this city. And after we prayed, the most fired up one of the four of us was DJ. (laughs) You see, when you get a vision, it changes your life. Now, we need to understand, visions are Essential. And it's kind of interesting to me. It's, it's been exciting having the McClintons here yeah. from Chicago. Yeah. And they, they come on out for three weeks. Lou, Jack, and Kathy have been taking care of them at their home. They even gave up their own bed for the McClintons. Pretty awesome, huh? So if you need a place to stay, Lou, Jack, and Kathy are... But it's really awesome. We, we got together with them this past week. And uh, we're sitting there talking, and I'm just trying to kind of find out where their heart's at about coming out here. Because in their minds, they were wrestling with the dream of maybe going into the full-time ministry. Yeah, I know Ace is getting up there. Amen. (laughs) And yeah, he married a beautiful former New York model who used to be a Jehovah's Witness. See, anybody can become a Christian. And they have three kids. But they were beginning to have a dream. And Pamela's a very straightforward lady. She goes, Kip, may I say something to you? I says, well, absolutely, sis. She says, you know, before I came here, I had a dream. Okay. Well, you and Elena were it. Okay. And... Well, it sounds kind of funny, but you asked us just to come over from Chicago and join you guys in L.A. And I know this is silly, but you asked us to do it by this coming January in one month. She's kind of laughing. I wasn't. (laughs) I go, sis, you're not going to believe this. That's exactly what I was thinking. And that's the decision they've made. Is that awesome? See, everybody needs a dream. Now, not everybody gets the vision. Right here, it was Paul that got the vision. And then I love the scriptures. Paul had the vision, and so we got ready at once. (laughs) But what happened was, God gave to Paul that inspired vision... And then those around him grabbed his dream and made it their dream. And look what it says. We got ready at once, concluding that God had called us 
to preach the gospel. See, they, they took it on as their dream. Pretty awesome, huh? How about it? Is God stretching your vision here this morning? Do you have a Timothy heart? Be willing to go anywhere, do anything, give up everything? Do whatever it takes to be a sold out disciple of Jesus? When Josiah and I were counting the cost yesterday, we just laid out, you know, Josiah's been a Christian 17 years, but it's still essential that we always count the cost by being a disciple of Jesus. You've got to get back to the Word of God. And a lot of people wonder, well, how come the church here is so excited? Because we call everybody to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If someone's baptized, they've got to make Jesus Lord. If someone is restored, they've got to make Jesus Lord. If someone wants to place membership, we want to make sure that they make Jesus Lord by going back to their first love. Are you with me right here? And so when you have all these individuals collectively making Jesus the Lord of their life, and God is their Father... Then God gives us the vision to evangelize the world and turn upside down in this generation. Are you with me right here? What is your kingdom dream? If we ask you today to go with DJ and Casey, are you ready to go? You go, we got the vision and we got ready at once. If we said, hey, Victor and Aurora are going to Mexico City. And you go, but I don't speak Spanish. But will you get ready at once to go? We have to have this heart to be willing to do whatever it takes to be a sold out disciple of Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? Let's move on with the text. Our second point, side by side preaching. Verse 11. Again, you can watch the map and see where things are going. For Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river, that's the Ganges, where we expected to find a place of prayer. There evidently was no synagogue there. So they go to a place of prayer where they would find the Jewish people. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth in the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her house were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she says, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Let me tell you something. That's a powerful woman that can persuade Paul. Amen, guys? <laughs> now, right here, we see some of the insights into the ministry of Paul that we need to incorporate. Okay. Number one, Paul begins to understand that he wasn't about establishing little autonomous churches. He was about establishing pillar churches that would spread out the word, spread out the influence to that whole region. And so he goes, and the Bible says right here, he travels to Philippi, the leading city of that district of Macedonia. There were four districts at that time in Macedonia. And Philippi was the most prominent in all of Macedonia. Of course, it was named after Philip the Great, the father of Alexander the Great. And so this was the prominent city for all of Macedonia. And it's there that Paul goes. So number one, we find that Paul goes to major cities first. That way the gospel flows out into the smaller cities and to the countryside. Number two, and this one's a challenge for all of us. He goes to opinion leaders. I mean, you got to admit... If Lydia can persuade Paul, she's flat an opinion leader. But as we go through our text today, you'll find that in establishing the church in particular, Paul wanted to go after opinion leaders. Why? Because they swayed other people's opinion, and if they became disciples, more people would become disciples. Now, we think of opinion leaders as the people that have gotten the great degrees at UCLA and are making two million bucks. Let me tell you something. You can be an opinion leader by being a gang leader. You hold a lot of people's opinion at bay right there. It's not what station you are. There are opinion leaders in every core and every element of society. And Paul went after the opinion leaders. Thirdly, we'll see that as he preached the gospel, there was always persecution. And that was a signal to move on. Let's continue our text. Verse 16. 
Once when we were going to place a prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. You imagine having someone like that going around? <laughs> now get this, verse 18. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Now you got to admit, Paul had a lot of patience. <laughs> Can you imagine someone following you around your college campus going, This is a servant of the Most High God who's going to tell you how to be saved. <laughs> Easy. That's what I'm doing, but I'd like to kind of just slide in there a little bit. <laughs> How would you like to have that girl in front of your, in your, in your house, out in the front lawn? These are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you how to be saved. <laughs> now, Paul had the gift of casting out demons, and, and uh, this went on for a couple of days, and he was getting in pain. He just, how do you, how do you get out? <laughs> Let's see what happened. Surely, everybody must have been happy freeing her from this, sure. this spirit. <laughs> Verse 19. When the owners of the slave girl realized that the hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews, and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. That wasn't the real issue. Their pocketbooks were getting hit. Look what happens. The crowd joined together and attacked against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them into the inner cell, the dungeon. And fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And you thought your week was hard. Midnight. They're down in the dungeon. They're in chains. They're tired. They're bleeding. What are they doing at midnight? Watching Jay Leno? <laughs> Complaining about the traffic that day? No. They are praying and singing hymns to God. And I love this, that little line right there. And the other prisoners were listening. Now you might say they had a captive audience. And I don't know whether the guys could sing too well. But you got to admit, if two guys were this beaten in chains and they're singing, it had to get your attention, it had to cross your mind. These guys are different. There's something different. I can't put my finger right on it. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open. Everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, D -d Don't harm you! you, you we're all here! Now, we understand from our study of chapter 12 that if a prisoner escapes from a Roman guard, they'll be killed. That's what happened in Romans 12 when Peter escaped from the Roman guards. Now, very often... A Roman guard would first be tortured and then killed. And so here the head jailer is going, man, I'm just going to end it. I, at least I'm going to save my family of anything and, and I'm going to spare myself a torture. I'm going to kill myself. And Paul goes, hey, hey, dude, don't. We're, we're all here. Verse 29. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Have you ever been in almost a car wreck? And it's so close. I mean, you just start shaking. Oh, yeah. This guy was about to really commit suicide. And when he stops, he's, he's, he's shaking. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing. You know, there are people all over L.A. Whose days and nights are so dark. They contemplate suicide. And someone's got to turn the light on. He then said to them and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's not asking the spiritual question right there. But you know our brother Paul, he's going to take advantage of the situation. Yeah. They replied, Believe the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved, you and your household. Then he spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his family were baptized. 
The jailer brought them into his house, sent a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Why did he get baptized in the middle of the night? Because he didn't know if he was promised the next day. Because Paul was free. And he might be killed. We are never promised tomorrow. You know, right here, I find it fascinating that after Paul says, hey, if you want to be saved, you've got to believe in Jesus. And then they go in and they preach the word of the Lord. And then they're baptized. But right in between the baptism is a curious note. It says, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. That was his repentance. He was the guy that most likely beat them, or at least watched over the beating. And what's he do in repentance? Instead of treating him as prisoners, he says, come into my house. Let me wash your wounds. And they're baptized in the middle of the night. He says, here, have some food. We are just so fired up to be disciples of Jesus. I love this next part. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. And Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial. Yet, we are Roman citizens. And they threw us in the prison. Now right here we get a clue that's going to be very important in the latter part of the book of Acts. That pulling the Roman citizenship card is a very good thing. It wasn't by chance that Paul was born a Roman citizen. See, it's not by chance that you're born white or black or Asian. It's not by chance that you're born in the place you were born. Some people have resented where they were born, how they were raised, what they looked like. Let me tell you something. It's not by chance, it's by God, and there's a purpose behind it. And Paul began to understand why he was born a Roman citizen. He says, they beat us publicly without trial, even though we were Roman citizens, threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Paul had a little edge about him. <laughs> the officers reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. See, they would be beaten. They came to appease them and escorted them from prison, requesting them to leave the city. Hey, guys, could you please leave quietly? After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. See, you know, when you really un- understand the fellowship, you're just not going to leave when you get a chance to leave. you got to hang around a while. Yeah. I mean, it's tough getting people out of this room right after the last amen here. We love the Lord, and therefore we love the fellowship. It's not a matter of beating the Baptist to Burger King here. We really want to hang around. We, we want to be with each other. We love each other. This is, this is our spiritual family. And when we're done fellowshipping, then we leave. Amen? Side by side, preaching the gospel. Chapter 17. When they passed through... Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went to the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I proclaim to you as the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few prominent women. Ah! We've seen Lydia, opinion leader. We've seen the head jailer, opinion leader. And now we see prominent women. Opinion leaders. How about you? Are you going after opinion leaders? Or do they scare you? Or do you lack faith? Say, well, they have such deep convictions about what they believe. That's the point. That's why they need to become disciples. It's not you persuading them. It is the word of God. That's what got these women, these prominent women, to become disciples. You know, I am. I mean, it was awesome. I mean, when Pamela first shared that she come from a Jehovah's Witness background. Everybody goes, "Ooh, baby, that's awesome!" Because yeah. then we start thinking, "Hey, the Bible really works, and what we believe is really true." <laughs> <laughs> but we have to have deep convictions. Yeah. Is the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God that persuades and changes men? We are but the servants of God that must have the boldness to go to these people 
of influence. These individuals that are opinion leaders. And God will get them for us. Amen? Amen. Well, look what happens. It's all these people are becoming Christians. Verse 5. But the Jews were jealous. So they round up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed them up, and started a riot in the city. Can you imagine? The Jews were jealous. Why? It's because the disciples were having the people come over to their church. And they were leaving the Jewish church. And they were ticked off. Hey, you're leaving. You're getting more people than us. Can you imagine that? <laughs> they rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. These troublemakers are causing trouble all over the world. King James Version says, These are the ones that have turned the world upside down. They've come here also. You see, turning the world upside down was a negative thing. But for us, it's turning the world right side up. You see, when you preach the word, there's going to be persecution. Well, the brothers scoot Paul and company on out and down to Berea, chapter 10, uh, verse 10, chapter 17. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Bereans were in more noble character than Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said were true. Many Jews believe also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. You know, have you ever wondered, what does it really mean to have a noble character in the eyes of God? Because that's really all that counts, isn't it? Just to have a noble character in the eyes of God? Well, it tells you right here. The first test is, is to have a noble character as God. When you hear the word of God, you go, I'm fired up. That's awesome. How about it? First test, okay. Second test. You're going to test out what the speaker said. So in our congregation here, I pray that most everybody likes me okay. <laughs> but everybody's got their Bible and everybody's got a notepad. Why? Because they want to check out what I say is the truth. If it's not the truth, then just forget it. But if it is the truth, it's not some graying, balding old guy that's saying it. It is the Word of God. And it must be obeyed. It must be obeyed. Secondly, in doing that test, you've got to examine the Scriptures. Well, how often? Every day. And then once you examine the Scriptures, then you've got to make a decision about it. How about it? Is that where you're at? You've been wrestling with getting baptized? Do you have a noble character? You study the scriptures every day? You're in there? You're ready to make a decision? How about it? Did you fall away? But you want to come back? Well, how about it? Are you in the scriptures every day and ready to make some radical decisions? How about it? Are you in a fellowship that just isn't meeting all of your needs? Are you in the scriptures every day and saying, I want to be radical and sold out? That's how you make radical decisions, is by getting in the Word of God. Because according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it is the Word of God that produces faith. Amen. If you're lacking faith, get in the Word of God, and God will give it to you. Amen? Amen. Well, look what happens, verse 13. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the Word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul out took him to Athens and left him there for instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Now get this, guys. Paul leaves Silas and Timothy there at Berea. But Paul is alone in Athens. He's alone. Have you ever felt all alone as a disciple? Have you ever felt like I'm the only disciple that works at my workplace? I'm the only disciple at my campus. I'm the only disciple in my family. I'm the only disciple where I work. Well, let's see what Paul does when he's the only disciple in the intellectual capital of the known world, Athens. Verse 16. But Paul was waiting for them in Athens. He was greatly distressed. Modern version. Ticked off. <laughs> he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned the synagogue with the Jews and the God for Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. I mean, Paul is going after him. But he's the only one. That's the point. 
He's the only one. He's in the synagogue. He's in the marketplace. And day by day, he is preaching the word of God. A group of Epicurean Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what's this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, seems to be advocating some foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Where they said to him, when we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Now get this. The Areopagus was located on Mars Hill there in Athens. It's, it's very impressive. I've been there. And the Areopagus is what you and I would probably call the upper court that makes the final decisions for the Athenians. It was at the Areopagus that Socrates was condemned to drink poison. This is a decision-making group. And Paul is invited to go speak. Verse 20. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Kind of sounds like L.A. aiming us. <laughs> Paul then stood up in the meeting there and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious for us. I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with this description to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown I'm about to proclaim to you. Now hold it. I thought he was ticked off. He was ticked off. But he didn't come across ticked off. He says, I want to find some common ground. He says, you know, I've been looking at all your idols. Hey, just bite his tongue. He says, I found an idol that says, to an unknown God. I really like that idol. Sort of. And that's the God I want to preach to you about. How about it? Are you so ticked off at false doctrine? Are you so ticked off at people's lives and forgotten your own life before you became a disciple? Wow. And you're not out there like Paul going, Hey, i got to share with you what I found in Jesus. i got, I got to share with you about my church. It's incredible. And you seem to be an incredible person. You have a lot of good things. I, I want to share with you what a faith in Jesus does. You know, we turn off so many people by our arrogant, frankly, hypocrisy. And, and really, the only difference between us and other people is we stop doing what a lot of them are doing, but we did it. We were in that darkness. And we need to have the humility to come across and we say, you know something? I was living a derelictal life. And the, difference, the only difference between me and you is I'm a saved derelict. <laughs> and I've stopped doing those things, and I'm fired up that I am. I'm fired up. And so Paul lays it out about the truth. And look at the response. Verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus. And a woman named Demarius and a number of others. Wow. Do you see the opinion leaders? A member of the Areopagus becomes a disciple. And Demarius. Demarius. She's, well, who's Demarius? I don't know. But if she's in the Bible, she was cranking. Amen. <laughs> you know, we have to have a deep conviction to get to everybody. And that means we have a humility about our own salvation. And when people sense that, they're going to be seeing our heart for what it really needs to be. And they say, man, I want what you have. You're different. I want it. Tell me. And that's exactly what Paul did. Side by side preaching. Point three is not down, but not not out. Right here, we read this, beginning in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. How about it? you got to ask yourself, if you're the one person, would you be able to establish a church there in Athens? He's got a church going, and now it's time to move on to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, this is interesting. Right here, Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila. And yes, they're already Christians. And it's very interesting 
Because the notation right here is that Claudius ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, we have a little hint from a historian, Suetonius, who says that Claudius got so upset at all the Jews in Rome because there was a dispute over a man named Christus. Well, of course, we understand who Christus is. That's Christ. The Jews were. The dispute was between the Jews and the Christians. And he says, enough of this. All of you guys get out. Now, a lot of us are saying, hold it. But I'm a Christian and I know the truth. And I'm, I'm, it's not me that's got a bad attitude. It's these Jewish people that won't convert. <laughs> and so you whisper, then go to the most worldly, ungodly city that's ever been, Corinth. Now, you know something? That wasn't Aquila and Priscilla's attitude. They were going, oh, wow, where's God leading us? You know, sometimes when something bad happens to us, we think that God has left us or God's doing something bad to us or God's being mean to us again. <laughs> No, 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 no. He was allowing Claudius to use Aquila and Priscilla to get them to Corinth. To meet who would become their best friend of all time. The Apostle Paul. How'd they get together? They both were tent makers. You know, there are a lot of men and women in this room that want to preach the word full time. Amen, guys? And that's an awesome ambition. But, you know, Paul was willing to build tents. And he did it, the Bible says, until the money came with Timothy. What is your heart? Are you as sold out when you have to work a job as when you get paid to do the ministry? You see, for the disciple, ministry is ministry. And if you have to do a few tents, then so be it. Just don't look like a tent. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) And so the money comes and Paul goes back to full-time preaching. Well, what happened there in Corinth? Well... Look at this. Verse 9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one's going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed there for a year and a half teaching the word of the Lord. Now, if God says to somebody, do not be afraid, what's their problem? They got fear. Paul had fear. He was fearing for his life. And God says, don't fear. I'm with you. And echoing down to the Bible is while God was with Joshua. How God was with Moses. How God was with Gideon. How God was with Jeremiah. How God was with David. He says that phrase, I am with you. And he says to Paul, I'm with you. Do not, do not be afraid. I have many people in this city. Paul's going, I don't see them because they're not baptized yet. See, God has many people in this city of Los Angeles. They're just not baptized yet. But somebody's got to bring the good news to them. Amen? Amen. Well, we find after this that Paul goes to Ephesus and then he heads on back to Antioch and reports in. After that, he heads out in verse 23 on what's called the third missionary journey. He, of course, had left Priscilla and Aquila at Ephesus, and there they convert Apollos. In chapter 19, now Paul comes to Ephesus and meets the twelve disciples. Remember them? And he rebaptizes them. And then because he's an apostle, he gives them the miraculous gifts of prophesying and speaking in tongues because there wasn't a Bible in those days. And the prophesying would allow the preaching of the word to to mature people. And, of course, the speaking of tongues would cause people to believe. Amen, guys? Look at verse 8. What happens now that he's got these 12 disciples? Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with them and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Is that incredible or not? Right here, this is not all the apostles hanging together. This is Paul and those nameless twelve there at Ephesus. He says, okay guys, we've been preaching to the synagogue, we've been kicked out. Now it's time to go to the gospel, uh, to the Gentiles. we got to preach the gospel. Where does he go? He goes to the lecture all around. He starts a campus ministry right there. And the Bible says right here that he meets with them as daily discussions, daily Bible talks in the lecture all Tyrannus. 
This goes on for two years, and all the province of Asia hears the word of the Lord. Well, the province of Asia is the whole western part of Turkey. It's so big, and we know it well, because that's what the book of Revelation is addressed to, to the seven churches of Asia. What's the first church? Ephesus. Remember when they lost their first love? And it talks about Smyrna and Pergamum and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. You remember all those churches? Well, all those churches were started in this two-year period as the Word of God just spread on out. These were not autonomous churches. This was a movement that was spreading out. And more and more people were coming to Christ. Well, how exciting should this be to us? It should be super exciting. Because if we follow this pattern of disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples... The word can get out in two years' time to a place the size of the province of Asia. The province of Asia is bigger than the state of California. As disciples, we need to understand, what did it mean to evangelize the world? What did it mean to evangelize all of Asia? That everybody became a Christian? No. There were still lots of people who became Christians after this. What did it mean to evangelize all of Asia? Is that everybody heard of Jesus and his church. And you know something? We can do that here in L.A. We can do that here in California. It just takes one good newspaper article and people will know about us. But we've got to be having an impact of disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And these were just simply, everyday, nameless, sold-out disciples that were walking with Paul. And notice right here what he's doing. He's got them in a small group. You know, Bible talks is our methodology, but that is how Jesus worked. That is how Paul worked. Because when you have a small group, there's an energy that's created there. There's a sense of family that's created there. And from this one Bible talk, all of Asia hears. How about it? What if something catastrophic happens and you have the only Bible talk in all of California? Can you evangelize it in two years? With the faith of Paul, you could. Amen? We know it's very powerful what happens after this. Verse 13, I love this. Some of the Jews went around driving out evil spirits and trying to evoke the name of Lord Jesus over those who are demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you, come out! Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, was doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the men who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. You don't mess around with the occult. You don't mess around with that. You know, it's sad. There are, there are Christians that just feel the pull. Of these psychic places. Christians that feel the pull of the horoscope. Christians that feel the pull of the Ouija board or even into the darker parts of the occult. See, sin at its beginning point is enticed by curiosity. You know, a lot of guys get into pornography. Why? Well, I'm curious about this site. It probably isn't, but <laughs> that, that curiosity, it got Eve. It'll get us all. You've got to crucify that. You've got to crucify it. Well, look what happened then. Verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Some say that that amount came to $50,000. Other people estimate it at a half a million dollars. Is that crazy what the disciples were doing right here? Well, perhaps no crazier than us. I mean, the Portland disciples, we had a special missions contribution in March. Amen. Cost us money to move down here to Los Angeles. And the sticker price has been a little shocking. And now we're having a special Thanksgiving contribution today. That's crazy. That's crazy. Of course, craziest of all was Wednesday night, I get a call from DJ. Now, I didn't know DJ would supply me with so much material for my lesson today. He says, bro, you know, my Hollywood ministry is trying to raise money for the Thanksgiving contribution. I go, oh, awesome, awesome. He says, and so it was Casey's idea that we go to this, this show called The Price is Right. 
and I think we can win a bunch of money there and give it to special contribution. I go, yeah, bro, and I'll be going to the casino tomorrow night. <laughs> now, I've never, I've never been to the casino in my life. Now, he says, here's the catch. I got to leave staff early. I go, okay. Amen, bro. So, my wise cracky mouth, I go, okay, guys, you win today. I go to the casino. <laughs> Five o'clock, DJ calls. Bro! Bro, Janelle won! $24,000, Janelle won! Janelle, Janelle won! She, she got a trip to New York and to Morocco and to China. It's crazy. It's, she, she won. Bro! No, bro, it really happened. I said, well, okay, bro, I'm going to the casino right now. You know, as Christians, we have such a small faith. <laughs> Janelle's been through heck these last several months. Tough things in her family with sickness. I mean, her knee blowing out at our beach party. Not having any money. And she goes to Price of Right, wins 24K. <laughs> now, probably it's going to end up just a few thousand dollars cash. But she's giving some of that today. Is that awesome? Why? She had that faith. That faith. That crazy, radical faith that a lot of us scorn and mock and say we're going to go to the casino if it happens. Just for the record, I did not go. Amen. In the latter part of chapter 19, we find things just go crazy there in Ephesus. There are so many people who become Christians, and some have estimated that the number of disciples in Ephesus reached 25,000 disciples. And it had an impact on the economy, particularly on the, the silver idol business. And so there's this huge backlash. There's this incredible riot that happens, and nothing comes of it. But there was persecution. You see, the Christians, they were knocked down, but they were never Knocked out. Well, in chapter 20, we find that Paul gets it on his heart that he wants to go back to Jerusalem. And so he starts heading on back. And so he stops off at Troas in chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs rooms where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't, don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again, broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted that Paul left. Amen? <laughs> I mean, a lot of people say that Paul preached till midnight. That's not true. He preached till midnight. Eutychus falls asleep, hits the ground, dead. Paul resurrects him from the dead. Paul gets something to eat. He needed a little something after the miracle. And then he preached till the morning. But it's amazing to me how many clock watchers we got in the church. Hey, that Bible talk. Heading up to about 55 minutes right here. Brother Kip, we're getting closer to that hour mark right there. You know, that's a Eutychus heart. It's not a love of the scriptures. Give me more. How about it? Where's your heart? Is it critical? Are you a clock watcher? Are you a Eutychus? Do you lose attention after 30 minutes? And you start going, hmm. Now right here we find that Paul's in a rush to get back to Jerusalem. For the Pentecost. Verse 16. Why? Well, the Pentecost was when the church started. That the kingdom came to earth. In other words, it'd be like the most cranky jubilee there would be. He says, i got to get back to Jerusalem for the Pentecost. I mean, you got to admit it. I mean, when the kingdom of God started on earth as a church, that would be a great celebration to go back to, wouldn't it? So he was in a rush to get back. And so in this particular case, he, he wants to stop by and talk to the elders of Ephesus to say, well, who were the elders of Ephesus? Most likely, those 12 guys that he rebaptized. Wow. Those 12 guys that he had Bible talk and lecture all Tyrannus. And in time, all the churches were planted there in Asia. But he gathers 
these men who have now become elders. And he shares with them this. He meets with them in Miletus. In verse 18. When the elders arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came to the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know how I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. You know, one of the things that's really awesome, a lot of the brothers and sisters that have been restored in a place membership, they go, you know, you know what I really miss is having a purpose. Sharing my faith. I, I, I'd be out and I'd fall away and, and it'd be people having trouble. I knew what they needed, but I wasn't going to church anywhere. My life was no... And, and I missed that sense of purpose. It was great talking to Jose. He says, brother, I've just been talking, talking everywhere. I'm just so happy. I just start... To, they say, how's it going? My church is awesome. <laughs> See, that's, that's the kind of heart that sharing your faith is all about. It's not, oh, i got to go share my faith. No, it was, it was a purpose. Your life means something. You're making a difference. Paul goes on. And he closes and he says in verse 31, So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now that's discipleship. You know, a lot of people start to say, Well, I think there's only group discipling. Not according to Paul. He warned them as a group, amen, night and day with tears, pretty heartsy, huh? But the Bible says that he warned each of them. See, true discipleship is a one-on-one relationship and a group relationship. That's the example of God's word. Look what he says. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work. We must help the weak, remembering the words of Lord Jesus himself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. When he said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them the most was the statement they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea. Right here, you see what a true church of disciples that love God's all about. They love one another. When Paul left them, he was torn away. What was their relationship about? They prayed at the beach and they cried together. I mean, there's a there was a disciple that walked in today to our service. And, and when I saw this particular individual, I, I just spontaneously started crying. I mean, that's, our souls were knitted one time. That's the relationship only possible in Christ. And right here, Paul says, you've got to remember the weak. You know, one thing I'm always greatly humbled by is that one of my great sins in the past was not taking care of the weak. And God had to make me so weak by taking away all my dreams, all my friends. And in that weakness, being cursed for things that I still believe are right, and just saying, just give me a little mercy. And then going, I will never treat anybody like that again. It's amazing how God teaches you. He puts you in that situation and takes you about that far. You think it's too far, but that far from the edge. And he says, hey, we got to take care of the weak. And and bottom line, he shares in the midst of this the three keys to building an incredible church, the glory of God. The first one, and you can see it right here. He says, I showed you by this kind of hard work. Number one, hard work. Number two, hard work. And number three, hard work. 
Those are the three secrets of building a cranking church for Jesus. Well, we see the kind of relationships they have. Paul's heading back. And they stumble upon an old prophet in verse 7, chapter 21. Our last point is simply, make the most of today. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemus, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Wow, life changes. The happy-go-lucky guy that just baptized the eunuch and then went on his way is now married with four girls that are prophesying. Life changes you, doesn't it? Verse 10. After we'd been there a number of days, the prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. He comes to Jerusalem, verse 17. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. You know, the thing about Paul was, he made the most of every day. And he wasn't afraid of the future. He lived for the moment. You know, I had an experience I'd never had this week. I was out with some disciples having lunch, and I, and I saw this, this car driving real slow, going into this parking place, but we were all seated outside this restaurant, and there's an older gentleman that was driving, and he started heading towards the table, and, and I, I was kind of afraid for the sister, and I said, Pam, get, get out of the way right here. This old guy comes in, I mean, really slow. <laughs> and he goes on in, and then he, he parks it. And he gets out and he goes, I'm sorry if I scared you. He said, I I didn't mean to. He says, I I guess that's just what comes with being a hundred years old. (laughs) You're a hundred years old. I've never met anybody a hundred years old. All of a sudden, Pamela gets up and then Kathy gets up and they go and just hug him spontaneously. And he goes, you know, that happens to me everywhere I go. You know, I cannot wait to be a hundred years old. I was just encouraged to shake that man's hand. I felt young in his presence. But you know something? I got kind of caught up in it and he walked off. And I got that kind of that pit. Like, like when you didn't share with somebody, you get that right here. You're feeling kind of bad. Well, he walked back. I go, here I go. Went over. Gave him an invite, talked to him. And he was very cordial. He said, thank you. And I felt great. Because I knew that Fred didn't have any more days. This was his day. This was his chance. You know, this, this Friday we had a terrible tragedy happen in our family. My sister, my younger sister, she's younger than me by 10 years. Her husband had a massive stroke. Very debilitating. The doctors, they're just trying to get him to live. And he may be in a very compromised state, even if he does. I've tried to be with Dana a lot. And, you know, through the years, we would kind of gotten a little bit estranged. And, and when this happened, my dad, who she really turns to, is down in Florida. And dad's 79, and, and, and here I am. And... And I just knew it was the moment for me to get back in there. In the midst of this tragedy, I see an opportunity. And I'd I'd appreciate your prayers for Bob. He's He's a true disciple. But, you know, I thought about it. I walked out last night, late, and I appreciate the Underhills coming all the way from Orange County just to keep me and Dana company. I kept telling them, you don't have to come, you don't have to come. They came. Then after they came, I said, well, thanks for coming. He says, no, no, we're going out for a bite to eat, then we're coming back. No, you don't have to. You need to get back, Lance. You're old. (laughs) So they go out to eat, and when I come on out, there they are. It's 11 o'clock at night. 
just waiting for me and Dana because only two people could be in there. See, that's friends. That's disciples. And as I walked out last night with, with Dana, I looked at each room in the ICU. I go, wow, these guys are not promised tomorrow. We've got to get the message out. We've got to make the most of today. What's the challenge today? It's very simple. Point one, up from uplifting vision. Point two, side from side-by-side preaching. Three, knock down the down, but not knocked out. And number four, make the most of today. What's the message? Upside down today. They turned the world upside down in the first century. True disciples of Jesus Christ can, will, and must Turn upside down in the 21st century. Thanks and God bless. Yeah.